Hello folks, it's time for Friday Fromage from the Farm. I'm Kate Johnson here at Briargate Farm and the Art of Cheese, which is my cheese making school located on a little dairy goat farm in Longmont, Colorado. And every Friday I bring you Friday Fromage from the Farm. So um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about washed rind cheeses. And um, I have this funny little thing down in the corner. I don't, oh, there we go, got rid of it. <laughs> um, and uh, I thought I would just start by showing you a little picture of a cheese, or I mean, I'll show you the actual cheese that has this orange rind. Now, I gotta tell you, this is not really a washed rind cheese. Um, this is Port Salute, which is a cheese that I bought. It's a French cheese. Um, but when I looked at this color and texture, and then I smelled it, I'm pretty sure this is not the real deal. And it reminds me of one of my favorite cheeses when I was a kid, which was Munster. You remember Munster cheese as a kid? I don't know, at least I remember it. It was this really nice, mild, creamy cheese, and I would get it in slices, and I would melt it on toast, and it had a little bit of an orange rind. And I loved that cheese as a kid. Now, that's probably telling you something, that it probably wasn't a true Munster, because true Munster is a pretty smelly cheese. And some of us think of smelly cheeses, and we think of like Limburger, right? That's the classic really stinky, funky cheese. And I, that childhood Munster that I had was nothing like Limburger. It was very, very mild and creamy. And it wasn't until years later, when I went to France, I was actually in Ricavere, France. If you've ever seen the actual um, human populated version of Beauty and the Beast, that was filmed in Ricavere, France. It's this little storybook tourist town with all these cute little um, French buildings with all these bright colors. But it happens to be in the region of France where Munster is very popular. It's kind of the home of Munster. And so I bought a Munster cheese to bring home with me. And when I opened that cheese up when I got home, whoo wee, it smelled like a bunch of dirty socks. And I realized Munster truly is a washed rind cheese. And that orange rind on my childhood Munster was not the washing of the rind at all. It was a colorant. And that colorant is a natto. Those of you who have taken classes from me or made cheese yourself and know that orange cheddar cheese is orange because we've added a natto, which is an extract from a seed that makes cheese orange. And sometimes cheesemakers kind of cheat and make a cheese that really should be made differently. And they make it look like a washed rind cheese by putting a little colorant. Now, Port Salute should truly be, if this was really Port Salute as a good French cheese, this should be a stinky, kind of sticky, washed rind cheese. And the way I knew it really wasn't the real deal was first of all, by looking at it. First of all, it's too uniform, it's too shiny, and it is too orange, at least in my opinion. And then sure enough, I read the description and guess what the last ingredient is? A natto extract. You don't put a natto in a washed rind cheese. So, and, and this cheese is pretty bland. It doesn't have much flavor. So I thought, well, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about Brevibacterium linens and washed rind cheeses. And I'm gonna show you a bunch of them that I have in progress right now. But I wanna tell you one other funny story because this is something that just happened to me last winter. Um, I was in Hawaii and I was teaching a cheese making retreat there and I had sourced some local cow milk from a very colorful character. And he told me, I wanna learn all about that cheese that is made with toenails. And I said, I don't know of any cheese that is made with toenails. <laughs> and he said, oh yes, indeed, sure. You know, I grew up with it in Switzerland and it was this really stinky, you know, pungent cheese and it was made with toenails. And it took me a while to make the connection of what he was talking about. But it has to do with toe jam. Y'all know what toe jam is? You know, it's that stinky stuff that gets between your toes. That's what a washed rind cheese kind of smells like, and there is a good reason for that. There is a bacteria in your toe jam 
that is Brevibacterium linens, bee linens. And that is this really stinky bacteria that grows in very moist environments. And your toes, you know, in between your toes, under your arms, might be that environment, sweat. In other words, often contains this same strain of culture. Now, for some reason, on cheese, it actually makes a really delicious cheese. And oftentimes, although those cheeses are pretty darn stinky, oftentimes they don't taste stinky. They have a very mild taste, a very creamy interior, but they do smell a bit like a gym bag. So I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about that. I'm gonna take you on a little visual tour of some of the cheeses that I have aging right now that are these true washed rind cheeses. And I'll talk a bit about the ones that I'm doing it intentionally, and then I'm gonna wrap things up with one that I'm not doing it so intentionally, because these things will grow kind of on their own given the right conditions. All right, so here we go. We're gonna walk over to my little um, table over here where I've pulled some things out of my aging cave. And these are all different washed rind cheeses. Now, sometimes washed rind cheeses may um, be washed with something other than bee linens. Now, most of us who are making cheeses from these um, you know, cultures that we buy, here's the one, Breva bacterium, that we might be adding either to the milk or to the wash itself, or both. And then sometimes we're also adding something called Geotrichum candidum. This is a yeast, and it makes kind of a white powdery substance. Often these are used in combination. Now, some people like to make cheese without using commercial cultures, and you can create washed rind cheeses and get Breva bacteria and linens to grow without the addition of these cultures as well. And so I'll talk a little bit about that too. And that's how we sometimes accidentally make a washed rind cheese, by just creating the conditions that those particular um, bacteria love to grow. But I'll start by showing you a couple things that I've got going here. So these are some little squares of Reblicon. Reblicon is a washed rind cheese. And you can see that the, the washing of the rind has just got a little bit of a white powdery, and now we're starting to get this kind of peachy orange color. Now, unfortunately, the conditions that are good for Brevibacterium linens, sometimes if you don't wash thoroughly enough or scrub, you see where you get some blue mold. And here you see I've got some blue molds on this patterned size side, and I'm gonna have to continue to kind of scrub those out as I continue washing this cheese. All right, so that's one version. Here is a true Munster, and again, you're gonna see a few areas where some of the blue mold kind of took hold, but again, you'll see this really nice um, kind of glow happening. Often there's a little bit of a white fuzz as well. And there's some more little crevices where I got a little too much moisture and some blue took hold. I don't usually worry too much about a little bit of that, but it would be a bit of a blemish. Now here's another little set of Munster, just to give you an idea of the progression. These are much younger. I've just started washing these, oh, maybe a week or two ago. So you can just see the little bit of peachy color starting to emerge, and there's quite a bit of kind of a white fuzz on this. So these are much um, earlier in the process of washing than this one. This one finally, well, I have to tell you, this is a little bit embarrassing to admit, but I ignored this a little bit too long at the beginning of its life. I made this and then I went camping for a few days and it was way too moist. And when I came back, the entire surface all over was covered with blue-green mold which is one of the reasons that we wash the rind, is to inhibit those blue-green kinds of things from developing and encourage this to develop. And it had just gone too far. I couldn't scrub it off, and so I cut the entire surface off, which is why there's some funny little edges here. And then I started over. And I'm very happy with how it's turning out. So it wasn't a lost cause, although it, it did, I did lose some cheese in the process. 
And then over here are a few more that um, I've actually washed for a while and then I decided to just vacuum seal to see if I could get them to soften up a bit. These had gotten a little too dry and a little too hard. And so this one I featured last week. This is a Morbier that has a line of ash in the middle. And this is my version of that port salute that I just showed you, not nearly as orange, um, but that is really from the wash. And then this is a little experiment a group um, is doing along with me. Um, this is called a Levero, and it is actually wrapped in some reeds. Um, this is actually from a cattail plant, um, and it's going to be orange in a few weeks. It's really, really young. It is just in the process of getting the little bit of white fuzz we're just maybe starting to see a little bit of it develop, and that's when we'll start washing the rind of this cheese. Now, what do I mean when I say washing the rind? Well, we have a little wash developed here. What this was was a cup of boiling water to which I added a tablespoon of salt, non-iodized salt. And that is your basic brine that you would use for washing a cheese. Now, I happen to have added just a pinch of each of these to it to really help stimulate the growth. And then what I would do is pour a little bit of this wash off into a, a separate container, take a little cloth, and just moisten the cloth and rub that surface of the cheese every couple of days. That's what the washing of the rind is. All right, so it's pretty simple, but the humidity is really a little bit challenging. And so I'm going to walk back over here and show you one of my accidental ones. Um, so, you know, that particular um, bacteria, in order to get it to grow, needs a lot of humidity, but not too much humidity. If it gets too much humidity, you get a lot of the fungal things and the blue-greens and that type of thing. But if you don't have enough humidity, your cheese kind of dries out and you won't get that to grow. And so there's a, a fine line, and I'm just kind of starting to learn what that is. Um, I'm finding that letting that cheese dry enough that just a little bit of the white fuzzy starts to develop, the geotrichum candidum, which I've added to my um, cheese in this case. But you could be making cheese uh, with raw milk or maybe kefir grains or clabber culture. And those will all develop this geotrichum candidum on their own. It's naturally occurring. But if you're starting with, you know, pasteurized milk and you're wanting to encourage that growth using a standard culture, many of us are adding it to the milk and perhaps to the wash as well. So when that starts to grow and it starts to just get a little powdery, that's when we want to start washing the rind. If we start washing the rind too early in the process, we're going to start to really get too wet and we're going to start getting blue and green mold. If we wash it a little too late in the process, it's lost too much of its humidity and your cheese is starting to dry out and it takes much, much longer to get it to develop. You will eventually um, if you stick with it, but you have to really up that humidity to get it going if you've gotten too dry. So I find that it's a little easier to fix it when it's too wet than it is to fix it when it's too dry. But sometimes we're washing a cheese that we didn't want Brevibacterium linens to grow because there are other reasons to wash your cheese. You might be washing it with just a salt solution to cut down on blue-green molds or to encourage these little geotrichums to grow. And so this is the case of my blue Stilton. And I actually um, had this question from a cheesemaking student recently, and the same thing was happening to my blue Stilton. So I'll see if you can take a look at this. It's a little less now than it was, but you might recognize there is some of that white powdery. Obviously, there's some blue, because this is a blue cheese, but there is a bit of an orange glow there. I did not add Brevibacterium linens to this cheese or to this wash. Now, couple of things were going on here. One is I do have a lot of bee linen circulating in my aging cave because as you saw I'm aging a lot of those cheeses and it will migrate throughout your cheese cave. But even if I wasn't, and this was the case of my student who had never worked with a, you know, inoculating something with Brevibacterium linens. First of all, there are bee linens in your skin. 
So sometimes just handling your cheeses, you're going to inadvertently give it some of this culture. You know, there, it's in the air even. If you're using a certain raw, like raw milk loves to grow Brevibacterium linens. But also if your conditions are a little too moist for whatever it is you're trying to do, that may really encourage the bee linens to grow over the white, um, the white mold that you might be wanting to grow. And so that was the case, I believe, with my blue Stilton. It was kind of threefold. One is I was aging this in a facility that had a lot of bee linens going on. Secondly, this was very moist and it was getting a lot of washing at the beginning. And I do handle it with my hands, which I do clean, but nonetheless, things happen. Now, am I concerned about that? Not really. This cheese today is about four months old, so I cut it open. I have to tell you, this is one of the best blue cheeses I've ever made. It's delicious. But the rind didn't quite turn out the way I wanted it to. If I had it to do over again, I wouldn't wash it quite so soon. I would let it dry out a bit. I would let the blue and the whites take over a bit first and then maybe start washing it a little more gently with a little less moisture to perhaps keep the orange glow, um, you know, at bay. It was a lot more orange than this at one point, and I began letting it to dry out quite a bit in order to kind of stop that bee linen growth a bit. Now, what if you don't have um, raw milk and you don't want to use commercial bee linens and you're not using kefir culture or clabber culture? You could also just buy yourself a nice piece of stinky cheese and rub the rind of that washed rind cheese and then use that same cloth as you're washing the rind of your new cheese that you're making. And you can inoculate it by stealing somebody else's washed rind. So that's a little bit about washed rind cheeses, about Brevibacterium linens, how they show up when you mean to, how they show up when you don't mean to. But if you're a little unsure about these cheeses because of the smell, I would encourage you to taste some of them anyhow, because although most of the time our sense of smell and our sense of taste are very interconnected, this is one of those situations where that doesn't always hold true. Something that is really smelly actually can have a really mild and pleasant taste. You also can control how stinky you get the cheese by how much you wash it and how long you age it. So if you want it a little on the milder side, just cut back a little bit on your washing and don't do it quite as long and don't age it as long. But these cheeses have huge characters um, and there's all kinds of cheeses that have a little bit of this washed rind um, kind of flavor and character to them. And I encourage you to try them. They're really delicious once you get kind of past the foot locker smell. <laughs> All right, so that's it for today. Um, let's see, tomorrow we are teaching a completely different cheese, but I talked about it in the past. Tomorrow is Cotswold, which is a really nice English pub cheese made with chives and onion, um, dried onions. It's kind of like a cheddar, but it's much easier to make than a cheddar, and it goes great with beer. So if any of you are interested in learning how to make Cotswold, I'm doing that tomorrow at 1 o'clock via Zoom. You can go to my website, theartofcheese.com, to sign up and make cheese with me tomorrow. And then the next week, I'll have all kinds of new information to share with you. But that's it for today, and I hope that you have a great weekend. All right, folks, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.